Welsh cavalry is back in action. This time, Afghanistan. Fighting the Taliban is their most dangerous mission in more than 50 years. As well as keeping the enemy at bay, the Welsh have to keep the locals on side. That's my good deed for the day. Many of the boys are just teenagers, but they look out for each other. I need to watch them carefully. They'll be all right, they'll be all right, I'll, I'll watch them. These soldiers may be young, but they have to grow up fast and learn how to keep their heads when the pressure's on. The last thing we want to do is just go headlong into something because if you've got a load of uh, headless chickens running around all over the place, that can cause more dramas. There's a lot of hanging around to do. 95% boredom, 5% absolute mayhem. PG came straight to the west! They're going to need all their skills and firepower to get through. Come on, come on in. Have it. It's the mayhem and the danger that attracts some. They want to test themselves. It is a whole new experience altogether. A good one? Yeah. And a bad one. This is life and death on the front line. Alongside the Helmand River lies Ford Operating Base Delhi. For five months, it's been home to a troop from the Queen's Dragoon Guards, the Welsh Cavalry. Today, there's plenty of time for Sergeant Butch Davis to ready his men and mastiff vehicles for the next op. Just uh, load him uh, water and rations on for the next couple of days. I'll, I'll out on the ground uh, four or five days with. These are uh, your new wagons, aren't they? Massive, yeah. Do you like them? Yeah, I like that. They are right. Uh, not bad. Out of all the vehicles out there, safe us definitely, no doubt. Uh, we, don't get me wrong, we've had some casualties, but but chill wood, no fatalities. First Troop C Squadron are here to provide armoured protection for operations outside the base. Three hundred soldiers are at Fob Delhi. They're with NATO forces, helping the Afghan government against the Taliban rebels. Here you'll find fearsome Gurkhas, Americans with all the latest gear, and the Afghan National Army. There's even a dog called Pip. The Spaniel is a highly trained finder of explosives. You can tell the Welsh are around, not just from the Dragons, but because they'll play rugby anywhere and stay up to watch it at three in the morning. Oh. There are 12 boys in Butch's troop. There were 13 until one lost half his leg to a roadside bomb. This is Trooper Punks. Trooper Punks, baby Butch, baby Butch. Why do you call him baby Butch? Oh, he's exactly like I was when I was a trooper. He haven't got a care in the world. He's always laughing, smiling, always follow morale. I don't think he's had a bad, bad day, has he? Been blown up twice as well, and he's still smiling. So not bad, huh? Ah, uh, not bad. This is Trooper Williams, Trooper Glenn Williams. One of those young 18-year-olds. Well, he's just turned 19 now, isn't he? Yeah, 19 now, yeah. So, uh, he's one of them. He's another three years, so I might as well. Like little rats. Okay, this is uh, young Trooper Jones, Caelan Jones. He does all my radios, he cooks, he makes tea. <laughs> he, uh, he looks after the vehicle, he looks after all the kit and all that. What's he like as a commander? Uh, he's good, he's good, uh, he helps, he helps a lot. You've got to say that because he's standing right next <laughs> to you. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, exactly, don't want to get beaten up. I'm quite lucky actually, I've got very good boys to yeah. um, I've got a lot of respect for them and I think the way they've worked for me, I, I, I'm probably suggesting that they've got a lot of respect for me as well. Uh, I've got four 18-year-olds, um, which is fine, you know, they, they've grown up, they've, they've done what I've asked them to do. Living with them, you know, and eating with them, and every day has been a bit difficult on times. How was that? Uh, well, I just, I, I like a bit of my own space, as you can see from the accommodation, uh, we're stuck together constantly. One of the troop I'm surprised to see is Dav from Llanabother. 
When I filmed him three years ago in Iraq, he wanted to leave the regiment because he'd seen so little action. I was a bit annoyed not seeing it. And, uh, I not was, being shot at? You yeah, were, not being shot at. You wanted I, to be shot at? Yeah, it was, it was one of those things where, like I said, I wanted to test myself. And, uh, you know, I was expecting it and it didn't happen. And I found it, I found it very uh, slow and boring out there. Where here, you know, I've been, you know, you have to be on your toes all the time because you just don't know, you know, every day brings a different scenario and a situation to it. He's been promoted. He's now in charge of this vehicle. The boys love their new heavily armoured Mastiffs. They're so much safer than the Land Rovers they were using in Iraq. The glass bits meant to uh, stop an RPG round, so uh, I don't know if that's been tested, but I know a 50 cal round, which is a quite, quite big bullet, has uh, taken a brunt of uh, that, saving the drivers and the commander's life. When they're not facing danger, the lads behave like troopers are meant to. <laughs> Farting freely and smoking like troopers. Like most in the army, they are fiercely competitive amongst themselves. And that's when they swear like troopers. Uh, yes! No! Oh, come on! <laughs> <laughs> no! No! Dunham! No. Oh. You're only gonna sh come on, come on! Oh. Come on, come on! Move out the way, move out the way! Shit! Did you not know? Uh, oh, oh, who was oh, that? Oh, 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 go, go! Go, go, go! Go on! Go on! Go on! Go on! Go on! Bollocks. To all. To all. 10 7 last night. Was it? Yeah, we smashed it. To us. You play this a lot, but all the boys. Ah, they do. I join in now and again. Now and again when I'm bored. They love it. The Welsh cavalry are part of an 8,000-strong British force in Afghanistan's Helmand province. Near Fob Delhi, the fertile green banks of the River Helmand lend it the appearance of a snake. Garmsia district, the snake's head, is now safely under British protection. Security has returned to Garmsia after fierce fighting last year when US Marines drove out the Taliban. But south of the head is the snake's belly, where a vicious battle is being waged with the insurgents. Travel outside the snake's head is dangerous. The big threat is the improvised explosive device, or IED. Used with devastating effect in Iraq, they've caused three quarters of British and US casualties in Afghanistan. While I waited to go out with first troop on their mastiffs, the regimental sergeant major, who's from Monmouth, took me through some of the hazards I might come across. OK, well, some of the boys have got are um, these playing cards, not just normal playing cards. They show pictures of IEDs, uh, and in particular some of the IEDs that we're likely to face out here in Helmand. Uh, first one, then, is the uh, sword blade pressure plate. Um, that's the uh, main method of initiation of an IED, certainly within the, uh, the Garmsia area. Uh, very simple to make, um, quick, easy, and easy to put into the ground uh, when they see coalition forces move. Next one we've got then, a uh, keyless car fob, and is a remote uh, way of setting off an IED without uh, any real risk to the, uh, the insurgent himself. Uh, there we've got his detonating cord. They use that from the pressure plate to the IED to initiate it. Um, and uh, quite often, if they don't lay that correctly, it's something that we can pick up on because it looks uh, odd when laid on the ground, obviously. Another one we've got there, then, is the suicide vest. It has been used out here uh, a number of times. Thankfully, uh, we've not seen it yet. And the last one I've got here, really, is the 107 rocket. Used quite a lot throughout the, uh, the Hellman um, area. Normally causing more damage to civilian property and to civilian farmers that are working in fields when the, uh, the rockets overfly. The, the patrol bases that they're, they're firing at. As first troop prepare to leave the base, they don't need reminding about the IED danger. They've been hit three times in four months. Yeah, always the risk, whatever you go on is, uh, like when we was out in Iraq, but... Yeah, it'll be all right. It should be all right. Trooper Panks from Kite Philly has had two close calls. Go, let's roll. We got to a patrol base too. As we turned around, we drove about 20 metres and uh, it just hit us. It was the back end, took both back axles off. And uh, uh, scary. 
There's all the ammunition that was inside was just flying about everywhere. I looked behind uh, Colt Meadows was uh, shouting out my leg. Because he was on the gun, he got thrown out the top and then he went back in and, and the gunner stand had all been ripped up from the force. And on the way back down, I think he cut his leg on top, which uh, done nerve damage, I think. And uh, he couldn't get blood then to the bottom of his leg. So unfortunately he lost it. I, I just thought they were going to start firing at us and I didn't know what to think, to be honest. Just scared. Really scared. Finally got in and Butch was waiting for us, waiting for me. Give me a big hug. You know, Mastiff has proved itself over and over again. A small troop like we are of, of 13 guys, three IEDs, that possibly could have been nine, nine, casual, nine major casualties, possibly people dead, if we'd been in something you know, not small like a Land Rover or something. The heavy armour of First Troop's Mastiffs is used to transport the infantry. Today, we're going north of the Snake's Head towards the town of Nawar. The aim is to test what the army calls the atmospherics. Will villagers welcome them, or are they coming under the influence of the Taliban? Around the Snake's Head, it's a battleground for people's hearts and minds. The Taliban want to dominate these villages and use them to attack NATO forces. So far, there are no smiles from the adults as our heavily armoured convoy lumbers through. But the kids seem friendlier. Come here. <laughs> That's my good deed for the day. No, no more. No more. <laughs> Despite all the weaponry, the Welsh cavalry must be friendly and reassuring to win people over. For Butch, a father of two, that comes naturally. Hi, Bast. Sorry for the children. But then, you know, then you grow up to be like the adults anyway. So, you do have to feel sorry for them. I think if, you, if you've got your own children, yes, you do, but. Uh, Progress north is slow. The infantry spend time talking to people, asking them if the Taliban are around. The Afghan border police, who are being trained by the British, are also meant to be gathering intelligence, but Butch is skeptical. There's the ABP. Look, the uh, border police has come with us today on this patrol. In the field over there, they just sat down. They just mince about, they just let us do everything. They don't do a great deal, to be honest. Can you say mince about? <laughs> Sitting down, enjoying the, the scenery. Further up the road, we stop at an empty school. The plan is to stay here overnight and move further north the next day. Village elders and the headmaster meet with officers to consider the request. The Taliban close down schools. Hardline Islamists are against the education of girls. While we wait, Butch shows me around his wagon. 
It must be the only Mastiff with Swansea City mud flaps. He bought them off an Afghan lorry driver. You've got quite a bit of affection for your hometown, Swansea. Of course, yeah. In the Welsh Regiment, we a lot of people from different towns and that, so uh, we support the rugby team. Uh, most people support rugby. Um, yeah, I've obviously followed the football team, so it's a bit of a, uh, a bit of banter between the Swansea Cardiff boys and the old football side. Then there's bad news. The elders and the school's head ask us to leave the village. They reckon we'll be here one hour longer. The Taliban will transit down from the north and take us on. I don't think that's going to happen. But obviously, this is where they live, um, and their main concern is that if that happens, then the collateral damage. And if we stay here tonight, they're all going to leave their compounds, which does counteract what we're trying to do. We're trying to say it's reassuring, they all leave. Oh, yeah. Dav has seen this before outside the snake's head. If they get caught speaking to us and giving us information about the Taliban, uh, that's them, you know, their families will be killed or they'll be punished in some way. So they, they quite, uh, they keep their distance or they tell us to, um, you know, go away. Cool. I just get past Yeah, mate. <laughs> Is that my fat self over there? The closest I've been to a man in a long time. The decision's taken to go back to base. The infantry and Welsh cavalry don't want to do anything that'll alienate the locals. It's evidence that just a few kilometres north of more secure areas, British influence slips away and people live in fear of the insurgents. And it's not over yet. On the way back from an operation, they sometimes have to check the enemy haven't laid roadside bombs behind them. It slows them up and they don't hit base till late the end of a sobering day. The far-flung bases of Helmand are at the end of long and fragile supply lines. Most stuff arrives by choppers, which seem to appear suddenly out of nowhere. They don't hang around because of the danger of being shot down. Everyone comes out to offload as fast as possible. There's a huge amount of movement. Soldiers off home or coming back from leave. Traffic between bases and the occasional VIP, including today, Shadow Defence Secretary Liam Fox. It's the armour and firepower of the Welsh which provides the protection for the visit. What British forces are doing here uh, is for the benefit uh, of, of local people here. British are building a new bridge to replace the one destroyed when the Americans stormed through here last year. Visit over, the boys relax. Life at the Fob Delhi base is basic. Men and women can forget luxuries like private toilets. Basically, it's what it is. It's a bit of uh, roofing, tin roof, bent on the bottom. Evening, Mum. Evening. These are called uh, thunder boxes. Basically, your uh, toilet. Uh, as you can see, the hygiene in there is very minimal, but uh, there is always a bit of uh, humour to be had on the walls, where uh, if somebody doesn't like anybody else, uh, they usually write around these. Um, I try not to go into them in unless it's dark, because of the amount of flies and uh, the stench of them. This is uh, the Puffin Billies. This is what we use out here to uh, warm up uh, the water so we can shower or shave. And what you do there, where the uh, carrying handle is, you just put it up on a hook and uh, you got the tap on the bottom and just uh, open the tap and have a shower. Yeah, there's always a bit of a queue um, during the evening because a lot of people, boys go to the gym uh, during the uh, afternoon. And because you get nice and hot and sweaty and uh, boys have a shower, it's about this time use your gold because uh, it's still warm during the, the day. No one complains much about the rations, although they don't get as much fresh food as in Iraq, 
and there's a lot of spam. Looking good, actually. It's, looking, it's not too bad, though, yeah, actually. The chefs do a good job, and, uh, you know, it's all the menu, like, and high in calories, and uh, it goes on well, like. The only disappointment is spam in the breakfast. That's about it. No, look at it, like, look at it. Yeah, look at it. Anyway, all soldiers have a box of morale, as they call it. It's all the food and uh, morale, should we call it. And uh, every time I feel a bit down or a bit hungry, I just uh, tuck in. First troops seem to eat the entire time. None more so than 18 stone Butch, who's very partial to beef jerky. Have you had a bit of trouble keeping Butch's hands off them? Uh, everybody does, not just me. Like, you know, you'll see, you won't rummage through, nobody rummages through each other's food, but uh, we, we all share, like, you know, and if you don't, if you get something sent which you don't like, you just swap it or something else. Like. What's your favourite Butch? <laughs> What's your favourite to? Oh, it's salad. <laughs> but all this eating means only one thing, and that's today's mission for Dav and First Troop. Every four or five days, uh, it's our turn to uh, carry out the shit bird, and basically all the toilets need to be cleaned out and uh, burn all the shit, then, uh, so uh, we can keep on shitting for the rest of the tour. Back in Iraq, Dav was the bad boy, getting punished with the nasty jobs. As a lance corporal, he's in charge today. Sometimes, though, they get me to just keep an eye on things, see if things go right, but, uh, no, my turn has been and gone now, like. You have to start from somewhere, like, and you always start with a shit job, should we say, and then uh, you carry on from there. It's just foul, you know, you just can't... You can't really describe the smell. It's just horrible. And it gets all around camp, the smoke, and that just lurks everywhere. So you can't really get away from it once it starts. It's not too bad, it brings us all together. We have fun doing it. Responsibilities come anyway because once you get a seniority in it and the younger guys come in 18, 19 or especially on a tour, you don't want to be mucking around or anything like that because the troubles you cause might, you know, hurt somebody or you know, take someone's life. So you have to be a bit more of an adult. You have to not father them, but just keep an eye on them and um, show them their ways sometimes along the line. If that's just giving them a quiet talk into you know, or a bottle of kin, either way, you know, as long as the boys are happy, you know, that they've done wrong, you know, I'm doing my job correctly, like. Dav also puts his more mature attitude down to having a steady girlfriend who has her own kids. Yes, I uh, met a girl, uh, it's not so long ago, actually, it's about a year and a bit ago now, and uh, she's got kids, like, but all is happy, like, I love them as much, you know, as if of my own if I had any. And, uh, no, it's going well, like, you know, she's supported me through this whole quite well. I have letters and parcels off her every week. And uh, she's always, you know, there to comfort me on the phone when I, when I need, you know. No, it's good. She managed to get a bit of cleavage and therefore me like to have a good smile on my face then. <laughs> I don't take as much risks anymore because, you know, once you're gone, you know, when you're a bit of a singly, you know, you can do things and the only thing that's going to affect is your life and nobody else's. But now, of course, I've got other people to think of. And, um, yes, it's, it's good practice, in a way, to have uh, children because it's just... You, you, it's uh, hard to explain. It's one of those things where, you know, you father... You kind of father the children at home and then you come out here and you have to do a similar job, look after the boys out here too. So, it's, in a way, it's, it's good, like, it's brilliant. <laughs> As soon as you leave the snake's head, you're in much more dangerous territory. Just a few kilometres south of Fob Delhi, the green zone with its villages and fertile fields are where the Taliban lurk. They were swept out of Afghanistan in 2001 by US-led forces, but since then the rebels have fought back against the Afghan government and NATO coalition. These desolate outposts called patrol bases, or PBs, are on this war's front line. PB Shamshad is on the edge of British control. 
Beyond, the Taliban are out there, trying to control the countryside. I'm here to meet up with another part of the regiment, A Squadron, which operates miles out into the desert. Welsh cavalry, infantry and Afghan forces are gathering to strike into enemy territory the next day. Uh, it's a set of orders for a raid stroke find, OK? So the, a scheme of manoeuvre uh, is what we'd normally do for... A I'm with Swansea boy Sergeant Major Rob Mansell. Mans is outlining the coming operation to his troop. I've always wanted to be uh, in the armed forces. Uh, I joined the, the army cadets when I was younger, a little bit younger than I should have. I think it was about 12 and a half when I uh, sneaked in and got a uniform on. Uh, and then joined uh, the regiment when I was uh, 18, uh, after college, and, uh, and, and been in for nearly 15 years now. So this is a likely area of a, a bedding down area for the enemy forces. If you look on this map here, in the center of the map, in the 2 zero square, we can see... We're going into a village called Mian Poshte, in the snake's belly, about 20 kilometers south of the base. He may be only five foot six, but Mans is the kind of bloke you'd want with you in a tight spot. It's his ninth tour of duty. This tour has been particularly good for me because um, I've been had a chance to troop lead and be in charge of a troop of guys, uh, and that's a, a wonderful experience and a, a great privilege. Just under a week ago, we had um, three uh, days of contact to the south, only four k's, three and a half k's to the south. The Welsh cavalry was attacked in this area just a week before. Watching the pictures his men had taken that day, Mance talks me through what happened. We were on a patrol, this wasn't an op, it was just a normal patrol, and uh, we basically came over the brow of a, a hill and uh, got ambushed. We basically got to take the, the fight to the enemy, put the enemy in the back foot, so we're, uh, the vehicles are moving down closer towards the enemy position. Uh, leapfrogging as they go and covering each other with fire. Um, uh, you can see the, the gunner's got his, uh, his drills quite slick there, changing the box for ammunition, and you can see how, quite, how close in um, they are. There's Corporal MacDonald firing the 7.62 again. How close he is in now to the, uh, the bizarre locations. They moved down towards the, where the enemy was, put the enemy on the back foot uh, in order to unhinge the enemy and uh, to get him to, uh, to flee out of that location. You see um, the airplane dropping a 500 pound bomb and then uh, also a GMRS going on to two firing positions. So the 500 pound bomb is coming from the plane and the GMRS is a rocket that is fired from about 60 kilometers to the north uh, and it's guided by GPS onto the exact grid that we give it. Bomb coming in. Woo! Smash. Yeah! Right. Absent. Have it. Those two uh, clouds of smoke mean that uh, there's uh, probably about seven or eight dead Taliban there that have just tried to, or tried to kill us. So that's good news. There's a good chance the fighting the next day is going to be even more intense. The mood is sombre. The infantry we're with, one rifles from Chepstow, had just lost three men in an explosion. But soldiers are used to living with constant danger and all know the best thing now is to get a good night's sleep. Afghans and the Welsh start the day in different ways, but it's the op which is on everyone's mind. I'm going to be with four vehicles called Jackals. Their job is to deliver close fire support for the infantry. In other words, I'm going to be in the thick of it. Mans shows me around our Jackal. Like Mastiffs, they've come into service recently. We can travel up to about 80 miles an hour with a vehicle, so if we need to get out of a situation, uh, quickly we can do. The commander sits uh, in the front there and he's got a 7.62mm uh, machine gun. We've got the uh, 50 caliber machine gun there mounted on top of the vehicle. The grenade machine gun uh, fires both armoured piercing and um, high explosive grenades. They've got the uh, SA80 uh, with the grenade launchers attached to them. Uh, we've also got snipers, hand grenades, uh, phosphorus grenades uh, and a, a number of uh, array of weapon systems that we can use close in as well, as well ourselves. Mance's gunner is Lance Corporal Daniel Lewis. Louis, as he's known, is from Llanrusted, near Aberystwyth. He's 23 and conscious he hasn't yet taken on the enemy in a contact. My job on this vehicle is the, uh, the gunner. I'm in charge of the uh, 50 cal. 
my job as a gunner is to ensure that the gun's clean, serviceable and operational at all times. The gun itself is a big black horrible beast. Um, if you ever come face to face with it, I could only suggest in one thing and that's running away. I haven't had a chance yet to uh, use it properly out in a, an operational environment. When the chance does come, it's going to be a bit of a scary moment psychologically as well. You have to pull yourself together and then just get on with the job. We're now minutes away from Operation Capture Spin 4. There are 36 infantry, 90 from the Afghan National Army, and 40 Welsh cavalry in their jackals and mastiffs. As our 40 vehicles push forward, in the skies above, a B-1 bomber patrols and helicopters stand by. A few miles further on, there's a sobering sight. We go past a cemetery. I point out to Louis that the green and white flags mark the graves of martyrs, dead holy warriors. Yeah. And there looks to be a lot of them. I think there might be a few more added to the... Uh, by tomorrow, I'm sure. One troop of jackals splits off to get up to higher ground. Mance and the main body, meanwhile, carries on into the danger zone. This is where they were attacked a week before. Anything uh, from here further south is, uh, is pretty much controlled by the Taliban. We're about four and a half, five k's north of where our last contact was, which is uh, just on the high ground, uh, just up further down there, about four kilometres. That high ground is where the other jackals are. They're snuggling. Men and machines creep around, keeping a low profile, observing enemy activity down in the green zone as the main force goes in. The plan was to basically get as close as we could without them sort of seeing us. Uh, we don't want them to see too many vehicles, uh, otherwise they tend not to come out the woodwork. Down below, we're poised to enter the village of Mian Poshte. Do you know what day it is today, Lou? I do. St David's Day. Happy St David's Day. Is it going to be a happy St David's Day? Um, back at home it is. However, out here, we're just about to go on and up. And it could turn into a bit of a firefight. It could turn into a bit of an ugly firefight. Think of that. A little bit worried. Time to poke a stick into the snake's belly. Farmers desert their tractors and animals on seeing us. The locals know there's going to be trouble. The roads ahead have to be swept for hidden bombs. An abandoned wheelbarrow causes suspicion. In the summer, the corn in these fields is much higher, providing perfect cover for Taliban fighters. So the enemy must be elsewhere. They know that because they're listening to Taliban radio communications, what's called ICOM chatter. Basically, Taliban are chatting to each other and they're telling each other to get big things ready because we're coming towards them. So, uh, at the moment, it looks as if contact may be imminent. The Afghan army, the ANA, and their British infantry trainers go ahead to secure the ground. In the army, soldiers are known as call signs. The other call signs at the moment are uh, clearing the, the compounds that we're hoping to move into this evening. Uh, and on the ICOM front, um, the call signs on the hill have picked up that um, a known uh, Taliban leader is in the area and he's set an ambush for the, the call signs. We're not quite sure where that ambush is at the moment, um, but. Um, we're, uh, we'll be set for it if, if and when it happens. 
Although up on the hill, things are still pretty relaxed. 95% boredom, 5% absolute mayhem. We're obviously we're in the 95% boredom stage at this time. With no apparent danger for miles, some of the guys on lookout can have some fun. There you go. <laughs> whoa, whoa, wait, watch where you're going, little boy. Oh, there's the other one there. What's his name? Frank. Oh, let's go and see if we can get him to fight. Let's scrap it. Go on, have I come coming over saying that the enemy have got um, enough fighters in their area, they're waiting to uh, attack us. Uh, they can see our vehicles, uh, they're bringing mortars up. Um, and we're just waiting to see how that pans out. We don't know whether they're talking about us or whether they're talking about the, uh, the two zero call signs that are on the hill, which I suspect they may well be. Mance is right. Within minutes, the call signs on the hill get incoming fire. They withdraw to present a smaller target. OK, basically, as predicted, there were two zero call signs, zero Bravo call signs, have been contacted uh, up on the high ground with uh, mortars, 82mm mortars and small arms fire. The int uh, suggested that from their comms that they've got about 60 fighters down in that location um, and uh, plenty of ammunition. However, they're always quite generous when they look over the air and that 60 probably equates to about 20. A wrong amber, a but after half an hour, it's noticed people are returning to the village. Perhaps that's it for the day, and the Taliban have moved away south. The locals are now starting to come back to the fields, just reassuring the locals that, uh, that we are uh, in this area. Because remember, the, the Taliban predominantly are not local people in this area. They're coming up from Pakistan, um, from Iran, uh, these different type places, and they're forcing the local people here to, to do their bidding, basically, and to put them up and, um, and to turn this into a boxing ring, if you like, against us. The fact that they've pushed south from here means that they don't want to decisively engage us, which means that they haven't got strength in numbers and they have, they're a bit cowardice, really, in their approach. The decision's taken to go to a disused school and secure it for the overnight stay. All seems calm. One of the guys has put a leak on his wagon to mark St David's Day, and I'm about to interview Mance. What was that, Mance? Louis. Louis. Huh? Shit, one's landed over there to the south, east. The burning bush and smoke in the distance is where the insurgents have fired from. A Taliban RPG rocket has missed us by just 30 metres. The men think this may be just a parting gesture from the insurgents. I think that might have been a shooting scoot. RPG or was it also small arms? Uh, RPG, I don't know who the small arms come from. It could have been Taliban or the ANA uh, responding. It's quiet again. Louis begins to relax. That's a mistake. Another rocket's on its way, the start of a full on ambush. They have to remain calm and work quickly to spot the enemy and move the wagons to a better place to fire back. Wait! Wait if you fire! Mark! Come you still there, Mark, come back with the GMG! The big challenge is hitting the enemy and not your own side. Friendly call signs, British and Afghan ANA are out there somewhere. Wait before you fire! You just gotta be careful that you don't push into those compounds yeah. there. I can there's nowhere. Uh, friendly call signs, uh, north west of the canal. Okay, I've got our location. You've got ANA call signs over there as well. Okay, friendly call signs on the mini ferrets. Louis knows he's closer than ever to firing his weapon in anger for the first time. He gets it ready. No soldier likes to be on the back foot, so they push forward to drive the attackers back. And the Taliban retreat from one compound to another. Oh, yeah. 
Finally, they see a clear target. Mance orders everyone to open fire. Cavalry's heavy machine guns are in full flow. This intense fire should keep the enemy's head down, but instead they return fire with RPG rockets. So the priority now is to bring in the weapon the Taliban really hate, the grenade machine guns, GMGs. These can fire more than 300 high explosives a minute over the walls of compounds used by the insurgents. Each grenade will kill or maim within a five meter zone. The combined firepower of a troop of jackals is an awesome thing. Red hot tracer fire is aimed at enemy positions just 200 meters away. But Taliban rounds are still coming back. Time then to bring in air power in the shape of two British Apache helicopters known as AH. They've been circling for half an hour, waiting to get a clear view of the insurgents hiding in the compounds. They'd be fucking crazy, City Reds at Nolan. The Apaches are lining up their targets. AH is just waked in for any movement, they're going to drop on it, okay? Is the FBI need something? AH is engaging. AH is engaging, Lou. AH is engaging. The heavy cannons open up, making an unmistakable, deadly sound. Someone's dying. Enemy firing positions fall silent. Pembroke Hapis, Dewey Sand. We're told over the radio the Apaches have just killed around 10 Taliban and destroyed a vehicle full of explosives. I'm quite surprised that they uh, engaged us whilst having air assets up in the, in the air. Pretty brave. Um, there could be a new foot on the ground for them, look. So it's a gutsy move because the thermal imagery equipment on the, uh, the Apaches is a, a lot better than what our ground sites are. With the battle over for now, it's time to return to the school for the night. We're staying in the middle of hostile Taliban territory and the insurgents could attack again. The Afghans and the British mount a round-the-clock guard and the wagons form up into a ring of steel around the building. As darkness falls, I want to hear from Mance and Louis about the two and a half hour firefight we've just been through. We were having an uh, incoming tracer, uh, rounds landing about 10, 10 to 15 metres in front of our, of our, our vehicle, until so we put uh, a heavy weight of fire down in the direction that they were coming from. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, quite, um, it was quite close call really today on the, on the contact front. It seemed pretty cool. You're nervous. You seem nervous, and you know. You look yeah, like you're I think I think more and... of it's ner nervous and nervousness, and uh, I was a lot excited as well, um, because it seemed to go on on and off for a long period of time, which I think is a uh, it's new to me anyway, and uh, I think it's just adjusting yourself and uh, getting around to doing things like that. The initial sort of haze of contact. Uh, you've got to take that sort of second to remain calm for for a few seconds until the higher commander has formulated his plan. I remember the first time that I was in contact, it was quite nerve-wracking, and you look into the, the person who was next in charge, and you can see that they're calm, and uh, that calm is you done. Because I was uh, the person in charge, there's quite a responsibility on my shoulders to remain calm 
uh, and give direction to the uh, the guys who are beneath me. Uh, so I think that's quite important for that. But you, it's quite a surreal situation. Um, you're quite focused on what you need to do, the job that you need to do, uh, and uh, the training that you've had, uh, and to carry out what you need to carry out. And, and afterwards, perhaps you can reflect on it. But you're so focused on the job at hand that uh, you remain calm really throughout it all. Does every soldier want a contact? Does he feel better for it, do you think, Louis? Uh, yeah, I'd say a lot. I wouldn't say all of the guys would want a contact. Um, the guys who do want them, obviously they'd want them just for a bit more experience, I would think, uh, to try maybe and test themselves. Um, obviously ensuring that no one's going to get hurt. That's the last thing anybody would be uh, wanting. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's what... I always wanted a contact out here just to see what it was like. And uh, just from looking on it today, it's... Uh, it is a whole new experience altogether. A good one? Yeah. And a bad one in the same way. The night passes peacefully, and there would be no more enemy offensives that day. With dawn comes evidence of the pummeling the Taliban have taken. Three bodies, including this one thought to be of a commander, have been brought to the building by the Afghan army for formal identification. It's thought 15 enemy fighters died in this operation on St David's Day. But it took a huge array of soldiers and weapons to do it. This body is put in a bag and taken to the local mosque to be collected by relatives. The Afghan ANA spend the morning searching the locals for weapons, with the Welsh, including Trooper Hill, who's in one of the Mastiffs, keeping eyes out for any more threats. Hilly, are they difficult to uh, to spot the Talib? Um, yeah, they are really difficult. Um, they got rat runs and um, from when they fought the Russians and they go through the compounds. They are really hard to find. Tough job, isn't it? Yeah, really tough out there. We did have a few yesterday. The decision's taken to get out of the village and head back to base. As we made our way back through the desert, we went past the cemetery again. There'll certainly be a lot more flags uh, joining those there. Well, a job well done in your view. Um, yeah, uh, it was a good op. Uh, no one was injured, no one from the uh, A and A. Uh, we're just on our last journey now to uh, hopefully get back to uh, the patrol base in one piece. But I want to know why the army, having put lives on the line, had withdrawn, leaving the village to the Taliban once more. The problem in, in, in Helmand um, is uh, it's a large area. Um, and uh, there's a lot of Taliban. There is a constant flow of fighters from outside the country uh, coming in. And as far as uh, not having enough troops, that's obviously a, a, a political uh, question and answer. Um, there isn't enough troops on the ground to go through and, and hold every piece of ground, every inch of Helmand province. Back at patrol base Shamshad, we're in British-held territory again. There's a party atmosphere as the lads, including those who'd been up on the hill, swap stories of contacts. Oh, that would have spot your day, wouldn't it, if it hit you? Yeah. yeah. Well, if it hit you in the grid. I would have manned up and took it. <laughs> It'd probably knock some sense into your brain. Should be like you, you a rocket and fucking fucking This is the first rocket that was fired at us, 107. This landed in front of the wagon. And uh, that's the third, third fourth. one, fourth one. 
Yeah. You had four rockets fired at you. Yeah, four yeah. rockets. And, uh, this one as we were driving back to the position behind the hill. This one, uh, we've seen it fired from over in, uh, in the compound, hit the ground and then bounced over the top of us and then landed the other 15 side. Meters. 15 metres in front of us, this landed 15, meet, 15 metres in front of the first call sign, first and second call sign. More close shaves to talk about for years to come. The snake's belly is a dangerous place then, but 20 kilometres north around Garmsia, things are different. Lieutenant Colonel Richmond commands the Queen's Dragoon Guards and runs the whole operation in southern Helmand from Fob Delhi. He reports back daily to Brigade Headquarters. This is yet another sign of progress uh, within Garmsia district, which has been widely hailed as the example of success within Helmand. Things have changed dramatically within this district, I'm very pleased to say. Uh, if you think that actually British forces uh, have only occupied this area of the Snake's Head around Garmsir for the last eight months. The, the progress in terms of the sense of security, the reconstruction and development, uh, the attitudes of the locals to us and also the Afghan security forces, it's quite remarkable. The people want it. They want our presence. They want the presence of the government of Afghanistan because what they are seeing is all the progress that's being made here. And what they see from the enemy is uh, the Taliban taking over their compounds at gunpoint, being taxed by the Taliban. They get nothing other than bad news, really, from, from the enemy. So I do think that um, it's, you know, the prospects are very good for the future. I want to see this success for myself. So the Welsh cavalry has taken me out on a patrol around Garmsir. I'm with Monmouth boy Jerome Tyson. The way into town doesn't look too encouraging. This place has taken a pummeling, obviously. Yeah, it looks like he's had his fair share of uh, of strife over the uh, over the past couple of years. But since um, since May, when prior to that it was completely deserted, it's now a thriving, bustling market town. So it's. Uh, the town has become a bit of a success story, really. OK, this is where the bazaar starts for, for real, really. All local shops. The ability to patrol on foot does show Garmsia is a lot safer than many other parts of Helmand. A ring of vehicle checkpoints stops weapons coming in. But Taliban sympathisers and spies are still here. Are there people here looking at us, reporting us maybe? I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Importantly, security is good enough for reconstruction projects like this and for businesses to reopen. But how friendly are the locals? Thanks, Amar. Um, some are indifferent towards us, you know, they, we provide security for them. They're not interested in ISAF forces particularly, they just want to get on with their lives and I completely understand that. You know, so, you know, I don't expect them to come up and shake my hand and pat me on the back. They're, um, they just want to get on with their lives and at the moment we're facilitating that and it's going very well. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Is the place safer now than it was a year ago? Taliban, Taliban, What does he think of the British Army here? What is it like now in this town? Yeah, it's nice to know that that the job we do here makes a difference to people's lives. Um, as you've seen, they haven't got very much uh, in the form of worldly possessions. So if we can enable them to have a peaceful life and carry on farming or being shopkeepers and they can do that security, then I guess that's a job well done by us. While Garmsia is a model of security in the province, the two operations I'd been on earlier showed the army were unable or unwilling to hold territory outside of the area known as the Snake's Head. I asked the colonel why. The enemy are um, 
always do try and intimidate the local people. So it's quite understandable that local people would not want us to be remaining anywhere for too long unless we were going to be there permanently. If we were there permanently, I think they would welcome it. But just the old temporary presence for a day or overnight actually puts them in a rather difficult position, and we understand that. And that's why we, we don't want to give false hope by going somewhere and spending too long there and then withdrawing. Uh, we need to be able to be there permanently and at a time of our choosing when we are strong enough and prepared to be able to stay there for good. In other words, it seems, everyone's waiting for the American troop surge this year. By that time, Butch and his boys will have gone. With the tour coming to an end soon, everyone, including Butch, a father of two, is thinking about seeing loved ones again. How's the day before I come over there? Older I get, the harder it gets. And the older they get, the harder it gets as well, to be honest, because they, they understand a lot more. Isabel's first day in school, especially Millie, she's seven, now nearly eight. Um, yeah, she understands now where I am and what I'm doing. Uh, Emma tells them that I'm just away making the world a better place. And that's, that's all they need to know. They don't need to know what I'm doing. Emma doesn't even need to know what I'm doing. She just knows I'm in Afghanistan. And that's it. She knows I'm here just trying to do my job and get back to them. But I want to know whether Butch thinks doing his job is doing any good. I, I disagree with Speedy. Yeah. So oh. I don't want to. Why do you, why do you disagree? I just, uh, I, I just, I don't think we can win yeah, myself. Why not? I think we've lost too many people here to be, uh, already. I mean, look how many other people have tried and haven't achieved nothing. My personal opinion. Uh, no, Do you think that progress has been made, though? Yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, this idea in particular, you know, the the, uh, the DC, the town centre has been tarmacked, and there's new bridges going in. And they got a government and a local governor. Of course, there's uh, progress going. But I just think, you know, so many people have tried before. I think as soon as we pull out here, the, the Taliban will take over again. What is, gives you the job satisfaction then? When I go out on the ground and every fucker comes back. <laughs> The regiment has taken more casualties on this tour than any since it was formed 50 years ago. Just after I left, two corporals with the Welsh cavalry were killed when their jackal was blown up by a roadside bomb. Their names will be added to this memorial at Fob Delhi. With just days to go now, there's a chance for a first troop photo for old times' sake. Butcher's priority is to get them all through the last op safely. You ask anyone, the most accidents happen out here, the first couple of weeks here at all and the last couple of weeks here at all. Um, where there's the nervous period of settling in or excited about getting out. So, yeah, you need to watch them carefully. But they, they'll be all right, they'll be all right. I'll, I'll watch them and uh, we'll get the op done and head up to Bastion. Camp Bastion's just the first stop on a long journey home but it'll pass quickly for them after six months on Afghanistan's front line. In London, Question Time in 40 minutes on BBC One Wales after the news next.